Okay. All right, guys. Welcome to Turf Club this week. Uh, Kyle's not joining us because he's down currently at Aronimink, uh, volunteering for the WPGA. Um, but this week, we have John Ballard with us from Valhalla Golf Club in Louisville, Kentucky. Uh, John graduated from the University of Tennessee in 1997. Uh, and then he spent quite a while at the University of Louisville uh, as a superintendent, working his way up to the director of agronomy. And now he's at Valhalla Golf Club. So, John, welcome, and the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much. I appreciate you guys uh, uh, having me and uh, kind of look forward to going through a few things. I thought, you know, more than anything, I, I wanted to talk a little bit about just sort of uh, some of my experiences in turf, having been in it for over 20 years now, and, and, and maybe uh, shed a little bit of light on that. Certainly want to talk about Valhalla just a little bit, and then maybe in the end, a few things, um, uh, some Q&A, just I, I learned a lot from students, too, in terms of what it is that you guys are looking for. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's interesting to see, you know, the, a lot of it does revolve around the golf course, but some of it's, there's some different things. And so I'd love to hear some of that as well, too, if we, if we get an opportunity. So, so we'll kind of dive right in. Uh, hopefully the screen share is working pretty good there. But uh, as I mentioned, I graduated uh, from the University of Tennessee. Back then, turf programs were, were not much. My degree is actually in ornamental horticulture and landscape design. And then uh, you could specialize in one of three things. You could either do greenhouse management, uh, landscape architecture, or turf. And so I really enjoyed kind of the turf aspect of it and, and went there. Dr. Lloyd Callahan was there at the time. And, um, uh, and it was good, but it's so much different and better now what you guys are getting in terms of education than what we had back then. Uh, but the one thing that I really took away from it was the opportunity to do these internships. And that's where I felt like I really kind of fell in love with, with golf maintenance and, and learn maybe even more so than what was in the classroom. Uh, the, the first year, I, I stayed kind of right there at home, stayed in Knoxville, a really high-end club there, Donald Ross Course, Cherokee Country Club, uh, and, and cut my teeth there. And, and for that summer, Frank Turner was a superintendent. I walk mowed greens every morning. Every morning, I, that's, that's all I'd do. I'd, I'd stop, I'd get a Coke and like a, a bear claw to sugar up, because I knew I was gonna walk mow greens. And so that's what I did. All, all summer long. Um, but then went back second year, I actually went out to Colorado, kind of wanted to expand a little bit and go see some different areas uh, of, the, of the country. This was a great experience. It's right in the Vail Valley. So the golf course at the time uh, that was there was at about 8,000 feet elevation. It was all bluegrass um, uh, with bent grass putting greens. They had actually sodded the golf course, which was kind of new when I got there. They were finishing up one of the last greens. They sodded those in as well. Uh, but uh, they've since gone on uh, that summer, they, they built a valley course, uh, a Fazio Valley course. It was about 6,000 feet elevation. Learned a little bit about construction and some things like that. And then now they have a mountain course, a Nicholas course that's at, um, it's at about 10,000 elevation. I think it's only open about three months out of the year. So, but that was cool. Very cool experience to do that. And then my final year uh, went uh, to North Carolina and went, and at the time it was called Pinehurst National. And I think now uh, the Pioneers Group has bought it. It's, it's number nine, I think, if I'm not mistaken now. But, uh, but it was a good experience, too. And, and the thing that I took away, not only the, the learning of it, but just different areas of the country, different grasses, and, and doing things different ways. So it's a little bit kind of about my background, picture of Cherokee. I ripped this off the internet, so hopefully nobody talks to me about it. I might even try a camera back then when I was there. It was kind of a cool one, though, of Cordillera, kind of give you an idea of the elevation and the things like that. Uh, one, one thing that I, I, I didn't know at the time then, but we sprayed greens one time that summer. The spray rig came out one time. And so just to show you a different way to maintain disease pressure, not, not very strong at all, very low humidity levels. Uh, water management was, was certainly more critical, but, uh, but a, a neat place. And then finally finished up at Pinehurst, and uh, it's really cool to kind of see that some of the things that so after, after school, I got done and, uh, and ended up going, found a, a club here in Louisville, Kentucky, uh, Ottoman Country Club, really didn't know much about the Louisville market or the area or anything like that. Had, had several offers, and I think some of that stemmed from doing some of those internships, having a decent GPA, and, uh, and had some chance to go some different places. But for whatever reason, I kind of resonated with the superintendent, Stay, uh, started there in 98, uh, was the assistant for a few years, actually went through two superintendents, one left, he went out to Colorado, uh, another one came in, that guy left and went to go fly planes, and either 
either the board didn't want to do another search or maybe I made an impression on a couple of people enough to say, hey, let's, let's give this kid a chance. And so I got a superintendent's position at a super young age, didn't know much about, uh, you know, some of the things that I felt like I needed to know, but I did know this. I knew I was going to work hard. I was going to try to figure out the things I didn't know and kind of ran with that opportunity. And, uh, and it's really led into some really good things. So uh, was there and, and actually, you know, started a family, thought, gosh, I'll stay at Ottoman. This is a pretty good spot. We're going to be set up there. And then the University of Louisville jumps into the ACC in 2016. Golf is pretty big in the ACC, so it's nice to have a really, really swanky golf course. And so they purchased one just outside of town. And because of some of my relationships that I had established in being in town for a while with either the golf coaches, professors, things like that that would visit the club, uh, they, they had come to me and said, hey, John, we'd like for you to, to consider managing our property. And so I ended up going out there in 2016, thought, hey, this is great. The kids will go to school for free. I'm, I'm not leaving there. Uh, and then in 2019, uh, the PGA decided they were going to move their headquarters from Port St. Lucie, Florida, to Frisco, Texas, just outside of Dallas. And at the time, again, the relationships that I had built in this area, the networking opportunities, uh, I, I had established myself and Bahala came and said, hey, would you be interested in, in talking to us about uh, coming here? And, and certainly with Bahala's reputation, the tournaments that they have hosted and continue to host, it, it almost became a little bit of a no-brainer uh, to go there. And I think I got tired of being in the, in the office, being that director anyway uh, of the property. So it's, it's nice to be back outside and, and doing what I love doing. So I've been there for about a year uh, now and, uh, and it, it's been going well, although we're going to kind of get into some of here. So but I wanted to, to, to just quickly kind of highlight some of those things that I just mentioned. So there was a theme to kind of what, what led me to the path of where I'm at right now. And it's this network piece. I think that the more that you guys can uh, interact, get to know people, uh, put yourself out there, make sure you've got contacts in your phone, follow up and things like that, uh, the more opportunities that are going to become available. So I think that's a, that's a really key thing. I think learning things that are not associated with turf are, are key. Uh, you know, maybe identify some of the things that you're not so good at. It's, it's super easy for, for me to say, boy, I'm, I'm really good at this, uh, so I'll just do that all the time. But if you can really kind of look internally and say, you know, I'm, I'm maybe not the best uh, speaker or, boy, I really struggle with uh, kind of putting uh, budgets together, whatever, Start pouring yourself into those things, and that will absolutely help you as you get into interview situations, uh, whether it's talking with superintendents, a board of directors, or things like that. So I, I would just encourage you guys to consider those, those types of things with that network uh, piece and, and, and finding those, those skill sets that maybe you're not good, uh, that great at. I put work-life balance on there. I'm not sure I know what that is just yet, so maybe we'll, we'll delete that guy. We'll, we'll change him for the next Okay, so obviously I want to talk about Bahala a little bit too, some internship opportunities that we've got, not only at Bahala, but also at PGA Frisco that I mentioned, and we'll kind of walk through some of those as, uh, as we go. Uh, I don't know how much you guys know about Bahala, but it is a golf course that was built in 1986. So when you think of sort of really well-established golf courses of the world, they, they tend to be older golf courses because they built up this history. And Bahala, from an inception standpoint, doesn't really have that. It was, it was created in 1986. Yeah, it's got a really good architect behind it, Jack Nicholas. But it, what has really propelled Bahala quickly uh, to some of those conversations uh, are the tournaments that they've hosted. And so they hosted the first one in 1996, a PGA Championship, double back in 2000 uh, with, with its next one, a senior in 24, the Ryder Cup uh, in 2008, which the USA won then another senior in 11, a PGA championship in 2014, and on the books to host another one here in 2024. So you can see in a very short time, uh, it's gotten a lot of opportunities to host these tournaments. And as we kind of go through and look at some of these, you can sort of see who these winners were. And there was, I think there's reasons that they continue to come back. I think that the golf course, the layout and how it sets up for these finishes, it's had some very dramatic finishes to it where it's had playoff holes uh, and things like that. But Mark Brooks was the first winner, shoots 11 under, $430,000, not too shabby. But it's interesting to see how the purses continue to grow here. 
Tiger, everybody knows Tiger Woods, right? Arguably one of the greatest golfers of all time. He wins in 2000. He does that in a playoff against Bob May. Uh, so they tie after 18. PGA does a three-hole aggregate playoff. So you play 16, 17, and 18. Tiger birdies the first putt, or birdies the first hole, number 16. And if you've ever seen it, it's the infamous one of him putting, and he's walking and continuing to point uh, at the ball as it's going in. It's really cool. So Tiger takes home 900000 there. Senior PGA, Hiller went eight under, 360. They don't play the, their elders quite as, as much, I guess, here. Uh, I mentioned USA won, which was fantastic. And I can tell you this. I, I went – I helped out for the Ryder Cup a little bit. I was on the bunker crew. But went back and watched and took my wife uh, to it. It is, to this day, the most electrifying sporting event I have ever participated in and been at. Uh, we just happened to kind of set up shop at 17. That's where everything finished that day. And uh, it, it was unreal. It's like anything I've ever seen. So, uh, but Tom Watson. And then, and then finally, Roy McIlroy. Everybody knows Roy. Uh, he finishes on Sunday. It's getting dark, several rain delays for the event, and he actually, Phil Mickelson's in the group in front of him. Phil tees off, uh, 18's a big par five, you tee off way up high and you're walking down. As Phil's walking down and crossing the bridge, Roy's motioning to him, hey, we're gonna hit, we're gonna hit, because he wanted to finish up at dark. So kind of a, I wouldn't say controversial, but interesting finish with Phil not playing his shot, Roy teeing off over his head. Uh, he goes on to win that tournament kind of in the dark, and. Obviously, the purses have kind of escalated now. They're 1.8 million. I think I saw what was the uh, uh, the U.S. Open was like 2.25 is what uh, what the winner took home there, uh, DeChambeau. So, but we're certainly looking forward to 2024. Uh, we, we've already started with some just initial preparation things in terms of discussions and things we want to do. But a lot of what we're doing now will lead to that championship uh, in just uh, three and a half years from now. Uh, so kind of wanted to go through just real quickly, sort of 2020. Uh, it's been different on a, a tremendous number of levels. I think one of those is what we're doing right now. You guys are probably zoomed out. I certainly would have loved to come up and, and talk to you guys in person. Uh, but, uh, you know, I arrived in November of 2019. We're starting to get our staff assembled. We're starting to get going and bam, right in March, everything kind of shuts down. And so it changed. Uh, we had to change a lot of our strategies what we were going to do on the golf course uh, in terms of how we were going to maintain it. And it, it first kind of started in the spring with airification. Uh, we had a very, very small staff. We had nine people, nine people. And I, when I think of Valhalla and some of these great golf courses, I think of staffs that are, are a lot bigger than, than just nine, but we were going to have to get it done with what we had. And so we kind of made the decision, okay, we're going to do a little bit. We're not going to pull as many cores and areas. Uh, I had identified tees. I felt like was the place that it needed the most. Greens had tested out pretty good. So we started with some, some different strategies in terms of solid times. We wanted to go at different depths. Uh, so we started with our deep time machine across the green. We came back with some 648s, ran those at a, about a two and a half inch depth. So trying to kind of shatter that soil structure at different, different depths. There's a little video. So again, low on manpower, we're trying to figure out, okay, how can we do some of the things that we know to be correct in terms of creating this this uh, this pore space? And so we did that. Here we are uh, doing a little bit of top dressing. You can see we are able to work some of that, that silica sand in there, which we have silica sand-based screens. I don't know if you guys talk much about the differences with calcareous sand and silica, but ours are silica sand-based. That, that's a first for me. I'm kind of learning that a little bit as I go. So then once we, we did the deep time first, we came down to did that top dressing, then here we are running the 648s right over the top of that. Again, just channels, sand, and trying to avoid picking it up. Uh, here we are dragging it in. Okay, so same thing on fairways, right? We, we, we just didn't have quite the, what we wanted to do. So my thought process was we're gonna run the same deep times, uh, which we did on the fairways. And then rather than pulling cores, we we're gonna get pretty aggressive with uh, uh, running these verticutting units, which are really slick units that we've got behind these tractors. And actually here's, I think a video, another video. Justin, Penn State guy on this tractor right here.
So we, we ended up doing that. We went in two different directions on that. Came back top dress pretty heavy again, just trying to get some of that thatch and organic material out. Uh, so it worked out pretty well. I thought greens all in all, uh, you know, going into the season were, were in pretty solid shape and uh, it's a nice little picture of roots there. We are, our pumps had to be rebuilt. That was kind of, you know, came in, didn't expect that. Uh, so we actually had to come in and, and have all three of our pumps rebuilt. I had not done that before or been involved in that kind of process, but, but pretty interesting watching these cranes pull these pumps out. And the picture on the left, you can see pretty good. So the, the motor is it's attached at the top. It's kind of that, that light blue. And then that's the impeller that goes down into the wet well that's in, in, the, uh, in the pump house there. And so that's pulling the water. And so we had to pull all three of those, have those rebuilt. Just some verticutting on greens. Again, kind of same thing. We did the, the deep time, two different dip levels. Basically what you just saw on the fairways, we started running these across on greens. Had some nice success with that. So then we get the pumps back in, or while they're out, we had actually had identified, we had a, a main line break right as it comes out of the pump house. I'd like to talk to the guy that did the 90 out of the pump house and then the 90 immediately, but we had a break there. And uh, so we had to get that dug up. Uh, that's the HD. Uh, PE pipe, so you had to, uh, the, the fusion machines on that, so that was, that was quite a process. So started working a lot more with brushes this year, particularly on uh, fairways. Fairways are uh, bent grass, uh, poa, and a lot of poa trib, and so just a lot of legginess and standing over, and, and so we were really trying to get some, some dense canopies. Uh, we got these brushes out of Arizona and, uh, and used those quite a bit in the spring. They got swore to me, he said, yeah, you can use them all summer long, you'll be fine. And I, I, I just, I doubted that. I said, well, you just haven't been in Louisville in, in the end of July and August. I'm not sure you can run anything without creating damage on bent grass. But, uh, but we like what we saw. We did pull the brushes during the season and actually we're getting ready to put them, put them back on as we kind of get in the fall again, just trying to kind of groom, uh, groom the plant. Bunch of native areas. I think the whole property is about 460 acres. We maintain about 240 of that and about 110 of that is native grass. Uh, so we got these permits to do a lot of burning. Uh, we've been working with some of the professors down at UT, uh, Dr. Brosnan and things like that on some uh, maybe changing out some of these native grasses and, and doing some different ones, but we were able to burn. I think actually this may be a video as well too because fire is cool. So we ended up going through and burning as much as we could. We try to, so right now, this time of year, our strategy is we're trying to leave a little bit of growth up on it to give us some fuel uh, so that when we set these on fire, so we're basically trying to kind of sterilize that soil, uh, came in, sprayed our pre-emergence out, and then, uh, and then kind of went into the season that way. And that worked pretty well, but, but like anything, you, you've got to stay on top of it, uh, broadleaf pressure and things like that. You've got to you got to make sure you're diligent and it'll get away from you. Johnson grass, if anybody's got any Johnson grass eradication methods, I'm all ears. Um, so training, huge for us. So I, I mentioned kind of our staff was super small. Valhalla is, um, it's a top 100 facility. Uh, it has fancy gates when you enter the property. So when you enter the property, People don't care what your staff size is or what's going on. They have certain expectations. Uh, they, they expect the golf course to be in play a particular way. And so for us to do that uh, at the level that we want to, uh, I, I've deemed that it, it's going to take us probably somewhere between 34 and 40 total employees all in. I mentioned that we had about eight or nine when we were doing our airification and we were really struggling. I think the labor piece uh, it is something that's very difficult. You guys are in a, a fantastic spot, I believe, and we'll talk about that here in a little bit in terms of commanding jobs. But the labor piece for superintendents on their property, I think, is very difficult. We had subscribed to an H2B service uh, that is becoming harder and harder to obtain uh, work visas for these guys coming in, and it'll be interesting to see how the selection plays out and uh, all the unemployment that we have going on right now. But we ended up getting uh, 12 H2B employees. We kind of got them through a, a, a different venue. And so they had zero golf course experience, zero. They did not know what a green was. They didn't know what a tee, a bunker, mixed fuel, a weed eater, anything. 
And to top it off, they didn't speak English. There, we had one translator that was okay, but not great. So we had to figure out ways, how are we gonna train these guys to do the things that we need them to do? I don't know if you could tell in the picture on the left, if you look back in the distance, that's one fairway. We practiced back there in one fairway for an hour on just operating the machine. Uh, the dude was out there and we're trying to show the guys how to, we didn't put the blades on, but just how to operate it, how to make some turns. And so I took this group this day, uh, this was a Monday, we started at about seven o'clock in the morning and we finished on our last screen about five o'clock that night. And so patience was, was critical, but, but right, that, that's what we do. If you're, if you're in the turf industry, you're consistently faced with problems. You're a problem solver. How are you gonna figure out how to make something uh, that's not working, how's it gonna work? And so that's what we had to do. And I am super, super proud of the guys that are, that are uh, with us. Uh, I would put these guys on any golf course. They have really uh, taken well to it. They have a lot of pride in their work and what they're doing. And, and now they do everything. They mow fairways, they top dress, they rake bunkers, uh, they, they line trim, they do it all. And, and we're getting ready to start with a lot more airification this fall. And they're gonna be heavily involved in that as well too. So, so really excited for those guys. And hopefully we can get them back again uh, next year. So Amigos, uh, you know, they, they weren't the only ones we had to train. We had very, a uh, very young staff, very green staff. Um, I had uh, three assistants when I arrived and inside the first uh, really probably 60 days or so, all three of those assistants were gone. Uh, the lead assistant, the first assistant, the second assistant. So it was just me. And so we put a lot of pressure on, uh, we did have four AIT, or I'm sorry, we had three AITs and one came later but we really put a lot of pressure on these guys to kind of step up and they had to learn things quickly in terms of spraying greens, uh, hand watering techniques. Those were, those were two things. And we had some bumps along the road. It was not perfect at all uh, because it's hard to just be everywhere. But, but again, these guys have done really well. I mentioned Justin McGohan. Actually, I may have a slide here in a little bit that kind of lists their names because I do want to talk about them, but we had to teach them how to do some spraying. Here's the infamous 13 green uh, with, the, with the water feature. Not the easiest green to spray, even if you're a skilled person to do it. But we had to challenge these guys and say, listen, you're gonna have to, you know, we're gonna figure it out and go out there together and, and do that. So, uh, so that was kind of fun. I think if you look real close, there's one guy on it and then there's one guy next to him saying, hey, you come back a little further, a little further. Here's Nate. Nate was from Michigan State. Um, uh, super, uh, super green, but just a really good kid. And, uh, and actually COVID kind of in a positive way, Michigan State has gone to online class. So when Nate's internship was up, he's actually still with us. He's just stayed in the house and he's working with us and he's doing his classes online. And, uh, and so we're super excited that Nate's here with us. So. Well, we finally kind of started to get everything going, started to take shape. Uh, thought, the, thought the season in general was, was pretty solid uh, for us. We had some, some hiccups in some areas, and we're going to show those. Uh, Dr. McGraw's on here, and I'll it basically pertain to his area of, uh, of expertise. Um, but it's a, it's a special property. It's, it's really neat. Uh, the layout really gets really solid reviews from folks that come in and play. Uh, anytime that we have Raiders, when they look at the, sort of the layout, the shot making uh, capability and those things, it's really solid. We've got the history that we talked about. So if we can, if we can do our part and get the turf going the way that we want to, I think we, we, we have a recipe for some, some, some success here. Another challenge, first flood of the season. Um, this is Jeremiah uh, Barker here on the left. He's one of our AITs from Tennessee. So behind, this is a uh, six fairway, kind of little six. You actually have to cross Floyd's Fork. So that's Floyd's Fork. About half of the golf course, or, or maybe, not, maybe not quite half, maybe a third of the golf course sits in a floodplain. Um, we, we experienced these flooding events that come up. And in this particular case, we had some pretty high winds and had that, uh, had that tree that came down. This bridge, I, I don't think I've got a great picture of it. I may have one here in a minute. Uh, if we'll think about 13 green, but uh, the water level in Floyd's Fork will rise some 15 to 20 feet uh, anytime that we flood out and then, and then it goes back down pretty quickly. So, so that was kind of a challenge for us. Um, ABWs, definitely a, a challenge. We, we started seeing some of those at Louisville um, probably about three years ago. I knew that Mahala had experienced some of those because of my relationship with Roger Meyer and talking with him. And so we were scouting uh, from the get-go. 
and uh, and a lot of contact with with Dr. McGraw in terms of hey trying to get these timing areas down and things like that. Did a lot of documentation this year, which I think hopefully will help serve us well for next year in terms of matching up not only dates but um, uh, let's see. Um, growing degree days. So we really try to kind of match those up in terms of applications that we may make for next year. But on the left, you can see there's an adult uh, just coming out. And then on the right hand side right there, just some of the uh, salt flushes that we did with the larva. These are pretty, uh, I'm not entirely sure what stage they are, but they're pretty well advanced. Uh, Dr. McGraw can probably speak to that a little bit, but finding the small ones seems to be very difficult to do, or I haven't had as much luck with that. But then when you find them at this stage, you're probably already seeing a little bit of damage. So for us, uh, we have T1 bent grass greens, almost no po in the greens, uh, but the collars and the approaches as they tie in, I mentioned that we've got that bent, uh, a lot of poa trips, some annual bluegrass and things like that. So that's where we would traditionally first start to see some decline. And we would see it kind of in these offset areas and once you start to know what you're looking for and you know the time of year, it's pretty, you can dig around and, and find them pretty quick. What was interesting for us this year is we actually found them in greens and we found pretty large populations of them in greens. We noticed some pitting on, on a, a couple of particular greens. Uh, this was about a week after we had made an application on, uh, on the approaches and collars. And I thought, well, maybe it's just, we'd been wet. Maybe it's a little bit of that, and then kind of some further investigation. Finally, the light bulb went off and said, hey, yeah, I wonder if it's an ABW. And, and once we found those larvae, uh, you know, we, we knew how to at least go about giving it our best shot of attack. And, and so, but something that we're gonna have to stay on really for the foreseeable future. I mean, this, this problem is not going away. It, uh, it is expensive. And really all you're trying to do, it, at least from what I've seen so far, is you're just trying to kind of mitigate the damage a little bit. Um, I love, I'm a big baseball guy and uh, Dr. McGraw mentioned to me one time, you're just trying to kind of hit some singles, you know, maybe a double every now and then. You're trying to string together an inning. There are really no, no home runs and, and that's certainly what we've been seeing. So not only is there the, uh, the chemistry side of what we're doing, uh, the water management becomes uh, just uh, super critical. So these areas, you know, we might be cooling off three, four times a day uh, because the root systems have been compromised, the plant's been compromised, and so we've got to really kind of stay on top of, on top of those things right there. Moisture management, absolutely paramount in the transition zone. Bent grass, we have bent grass teas, bent grass fairways, greens. Uh, we have about 48 total acres of it, and uh, you just cannot let your guard down uh, for one second. So that, that was pretty key, and and teaching folks how to, you know, what it is that we're looking for uh, in different areas was uh, was something that we really had to, to focus on. Okay, yeah, so I do have a picture of it. I wasn't sure if I did. So do you remember the picture of, uh, of, the, of the guy spraying 13 green where it had that big drop off and you saw the, the rocks below it? So this is 13 green with this second flood. And this happened at the beginning of September. Uh, and just complete, luckily it was the Thursday before Labor Day weekend, so nobody plays golf on Labor Day weekend, so we were you know, pretty comfortable with uh, getting it back together, but it, it just completely smoked the golf course. Uh, this is number nine on the left side, that's better Billy Bunker that's washed all the way out uh, down to the base. We had to go through and scrape the silk contamination out before we could even begin to do any kind of repairs. You can in inevitably, you never get all of that. And so that's a bit of a problem. Uh, this is Mark Nethery on the left. He's one of our assistants. This is Amanda. This is another COVID uh, uh, find, which is great. So Amanda Potter is, um, uh, she's a sports turf uh, girl from Tennessee. And she was set to come work with the AAA Bats. And they just opened a brand new soccer stadium up here for Lou City and work with those guys. Well, all that got shut down. Baseball season got canceled. And because I had visited Tennessee the year before, we had been in contact. She said, hey, you know, I don't have a lot of golf experience. I've worked one summer there. Is there any way I can come up and work? And, and we've been super happy to have her as well, too. So, uh, so she's doing, doing great. So here we go. So this, so here's who we had for uh, 2020. I mentioned Justin. I put him at the top, Penn State there, right? And then Connor Whitbeck. Connor's from Michigan State. You can see my Tennessee bias. I've got two other AITs, Jeremiah, and I just mentioned Amanda. Nate, we had the nice picture of him changing the cup on nine, and then Zach, 
uh, did a, a brief internship with us. He's actually already back in Tennessee and uh, works for the, uh, the football team, so he's down there. Uh, but, so that's who, who we have in place and uh, are ahead in place for this year. And then just kind of some fancy beauty shots. Everybody likes that, right? That's pretty good. That actually shows you the water level. That's a normal water level versus where it was. So that was about a 12 foot rise of uh, Brush Run Creek there. Luckily it didn't get on the green. 18 with the, the, uh, the clubhouse, kind of iconic clubhouse in the background coming up. 14, it's probably one of my favorite holes on the golf course. Got a really nice elevated tee to it and uh, just really pretty, pretty nice the way it sort of sits in there. So just Briefly, kind of our, what we have, I mean, we have bentgrass putting greens, they're T1, silica based. We have pink cross tees and fairways, uh, bluegrass roughs, Toro irrigation system. And so we I put it together, kind of this mission statement of, of what it is. You guys can obviously read that, but you know, at the, at the heart of what, what it is that I think that we're trying to do um, is try to make sure that we are uh, the folks that come in that, that want to work with us and alongside us, that we are being very intentional about their. I am the first one, I'll raise my hand, uh, that younger uh, in my career, if I got an intern, you know, they just kind of ended up on, on the staff and they just worked, right? I, and I mentioned that same thing, that was my experience, right? I, I walk mowed greens every morning. Well, gosh, I'm not learning a whole lot, but, but we've really tried to develop uh, this mission statement to say, hey, we are gonna be intentional with, with folks when they come in so that when they leave, uh, they're better suited. I, I talk to my staff all the time about how do we get you to the next chair, right? How do we get you from internship to either AIT or assistant? If you're an AIT, how do we get you to that next chair of being an assistant superintendent? My assistants, how do we get you to the next chair of being a superintendent? And, and that responsibility falls on me and making sure again that, that we're intentional with, those, uh, with the, that line. Um, so in a normal year, May, when they come in, this, just a little bit of our structure, kind of the orientation, getting to know the PGA and some things like that, uh, equipment operations, uh, some mowing, course setup. Move into June, we'll try to get into some more stuff with irrigation. We have, uh, uh, gosh, I'm gonna get the number wrong, but our system is pretty extensive. Uh, so there's all kinds of opportunities to, to learn on irrigation. Really try to start putting some folks into some leadership positions to where they're doing some management. Uh, you know, the, the, your professors are going to teach you everything plus as it comes to, to growing grass. You're going to learn that along the way. You're going to make some mistakes. You're going to kill some grass. Uh, you're going to have some success. But the one thing that programs don't do, I don't think, is they, they can't teach you how to manage people, how to talk to people. How do you get, uh, how do you get people from different backgrounds, uh, different, um, you know, work histories to come in and get them to gel and sort of have one belief and one cause that we're all doing this together. It sounds all well and good, but the, 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 the more that you can put yourself in a position to where you're uh, exerting that communication piece, that, that leadership piece, I think the better served you guys are, are gonna be. Uh, record keeping technology, we subscribed this year. We tried the drone. We did the, um, the drone from um, uh, Greenside Technologies. Really cool. Um, I'm not sure I quite figured out how to incorporate it just yet. I don't know if we'll go back again with it next year, but it was kind of cool uh, to have. So each day the drone's going up, it's flown remotely, and then we're getting uh, visions, we're getting thermal, we get NDVI, and, uh, and just regular imagery of the golf course. So that was kind of cool. Uh, then we kind of transitioned July and August. Those were obviously our, our two toughest months, kind of focus on bank grass management, uh, just kind of keeping that plant healthy and alive. Uh, we do try to get folks into the shop a little bit. I, I would, I would uh, suggest or encourage if, if anybody has a bit of a mechanical background or if that's something that you think you might be interested in, I, I would dig a little deeper in that. I think that equipment managers in the next 5, 10, 15 years are going to be very difficult to find, to find good quality ones. And you can put yourself in a position to command a very uh, solid salary level. Uh, there, there is no doubt in my mind, I'm seeing that in our area. Uh, when I talk to guys around the country, that, that's, that's something as well. And in fact, Jeremiah, uh, he's one of our AITs. He graduated, he has a degree from Tennessee. He has spent a year with us. He was at Sand Valley last year. He spent a year with us in this AIT role. He's got a mechanical background and we're actually gonna switch him. We're gonna let him come back into the shop 
uh, full time. He's going to tutor uh, tutelage under uh, Jason Newman, our, our equipment manager. We're going to try to do that through that tournament in 2024. So that gives him three years inside the shop and hopefully put Jeremiah in a position where he can go out and then get a position, uh, you know, at a, at, a, at a club to where he is commanding 70, 80, 90 thousand dollars and up a year uh, for that role. So if anybody's interested in that, I would tell you to, to dig a little deeper and see what you can find. Uh, August, just kind of wrapping up uh, uh, with, the, with the season, just more leadership, uh, review of the season, and then, uh, again, kind of season-long networking and educational uh, pieces. And I think we'll talk, talk about that here in a second. So I mentioned this intentional development, right? You, you guys are responsible for your growth. I tell, I tell guys that all the time. You are responsible for your individual growth. Uh, nobody can do it for you. Nobody can tell you to go, uh, you know, read some articles about stuff or call I can tell you once you once you come on property with us, we're going to make sure that you guys are doing the things necessary. Before we go out with our sprays, we'll sit down the day before uh, as a group. We talk about the products that we're putting out. We do the math that's associated to them, so everybody's uh, familiar with that. Amanda, when she got to us, was not real sharp on some of her math skills. She'd be the first to tell you that, and now she can she can whip some of that stuff out pretty quick. But but we want to know what we're putting out, why we're doing it, and things like that. Um. I talk about this industry training. We, we did not do it this year. This was more COVID related, uh, but typically in years past, what we try to do is we try to get folks in once a month uh, to come in. So maybe it's a fertilizer rep or an equipment rep guy or something like that. And we do lunch for the guys and then just talk about things, right? Another opportunity to network, uh, another opportunity to learn a little bit, something different than just, you know, the golf course that you're currently working at. So we bring these guys in. So over the course of an internship, you'll probably have three to, to five of these, depending on how they kind of span out. Experience, I, I don't think there's anything uh, greater than just learning how to grow grass in the transition zone. I think it is hard. Uh, I think that the swings in our season are, are tough. And, uh, and I think that, that when folks, you know, hopefully when they come out, they can say, man, that was good. That was worth it. I'm glad that I, I went down and, and did that. So benefits, competitive wages, uh, it's $15. I should have put that in there. Maybe it's in a different one, but it's $15 an hour is what we offer for our interns. We do provide housing for interns. There is a fee associated to that. It's $200 a month is what the PGA asked for that, uh, so that you, you know that as well. Networking, I cannot stress that enough. Uh, and then sort of that Kentucky experience, uh, you know, and, and hopefully maybe we'll get a chance to talk about a few things there, but what I have learned in, in, in visiting with, with students and things like that, it's not just about the workload. I mean, I, you know, people don't mind. If you're really passionate and you want to get into the business, you say, hey, listen, I can work a 70-hour work week. I can work an 80-hour work week. That's no problem. That, that's, that's fine to a degree. But what I am learning is folks want to learn at a golf course, but they also want to, what else is in the area? You know, what else does Kentucky offer? Uh, some things like that. And, and we do have some cool things. Churchill Downs, uh, if you've never been to horse racing, it, it is great. The Bats. You know, provided that they're playing, it is, is really cool to go down and see that. We've got all kinds of bourbon trails, tours and tasting. If you're into hiking, Red River Gorge, Mammoth Cave is close by, uh, biking in the Ohio River. So there, there are things to do in Kentucky uh, besides just coming and, and spending, you know, three months living and breathing by Holly every day. And, and hopefully that's not what we're doing. We also try, one to mention, uh, two, uh, to get folks out to do one week of a tournament somewhere as well. Um, uh, we have a real good relationship with Harbor Shores. They host the Senior PGA Championship. I think these dates were from, from uh, what it was supposed to be this year. But the, the point being, we try to get you guys out, and we can let you guys pick what you want to do, but basically you're, you're paid for the week at Valhalla, uh, but then you go and you, you work on a, a tournament of your choice uh, during, during the summer. Got some relationships with that are close by John Deere Classic. Uh, we had two guys go to the Corn Ferry. Uh, it was the season final of that. That was Justin and Jeremiah. And it, it's just really neat to see when they come back to see they, they, they get to see how somebody else does it. They get to get that tournament experience, which is kind of cool. And it re it re it energizes them. Uh, so it's it's pretty um, and I think lastly, kind of just wrapping up here, I'll, I'll quit uh, yapping and we can, we can talk about anything you guys want to talk about. But uh, Frisco, we also have some opportunities in Frisco as well. I mentioned the PGA moved its headquarters from Port St. Lucie, Florida to just outside of Dallas. 
They're building two championship golf courses as well as a par three. Uh, Gil Hans is involved down there as well as uh, Bo Welling Design. Roger Meyer is the uh, director down there. He was the superintendent at uh, Bahala. Uh, has gone over. They are growing those golf courses in now, and they are set to open uh, spring of 2022. So they'll basically have all year next year to grow, <clears throat> grow the rest of the property. They've already committed to uh, quite a few championships leading up, including the PGA Championship in 2027 and 34. Uh, as well as some seniors and things like that. So they're definitely gonna have their share of, of big time tournaments. And that's it. Um, so again, kind of contact information there for me. And, and hopefully, you know, if nothing else, if, if, you, if you got nothing else out of that, maybe you got to see a cool picture or two, but you've got one other contact, right? So write this down, whether you come to Valhalla, don't come to Valhalla, if you ever have a question about something, you can call, you can email me, you can text me. That's my cell phone number. Uh, if you're not following me on Twitter, that's my Twitter handle. Uh, I always kind of enjoy getting on there and doing some cool stuff too. So if nothing else, like I said, you've got one more person in your network contact. And uh, and with that, we can kind of open it up. We can talk about anything you guys want to talk about and uh, and go from there. Um, I had a question about uh, your schedule through the year. You said you took almost a whole day training people. Were you guys closed for several months throughout a year? Or what's what's that like with the club? So the only uh, month that we're sort of officially closed is January. The weather will simple, will dictate kind of our closures anyway. So our play will really slough off beginning around uh, November, December, January, February. So for about four months, we won't have a whole lot of play uh, whatsoever. Thank you. So John, PGA is not too far away, 2024. And uh, is there anything that you're doing special uh, to prepare for that? Or what are your main concerns uh, for that? So right now, we are, we are actually in the process. We're looking at potentially renovating fairways. They're the original fairways. I mentioned that POA, POA trip. With the tournament being moved to May, uh, my concern level is not super high for them. But we tend to struggle with fairway conditioning by the time we get to July and August. So we are talking right now about a potential conversion to zoysia grass. And so kind of having those ongoing conversations, uh, we are gonna have a tea renovation as well as kind of a bunker restoration. Those are sort of the three major things that we're, we're taking a look at right now. I think the big concern with the zoysia grass is can you, what's your confidence level of it greening up? What kind of winter are you gonna have before? So how will it perform and look the, uh, you know, the, uh, the, the May of the tournament? John, I have a question for you. Can you hear me? Yep. Um, my students, there's a handful of them in here. They have six month internships. Do you have the capability of handling students that go from maybe mid March to mid September? Absolutely. We have, we have the capability to handle them really year round. Um, um, I, I know that those are actually better internships. You know, when you do the short one, it, it is just that. I mean, by the time Zach did that one, he was in and out pretty quickly. Uh, I know Tennessee's gone to like a spring block where the kids get out in February and so they come on in March. And so I think it not only helps the students because that's when we're doing a lot of heavy agronomics, it helps us. It gives us some more bodies to, to get the work done and things like that. But we can, we can absolutely handle that. Uh, the house that we have on property can accommodate up to eight. I try to target about six uh, is, is where I think my, kind of my sweet spot is for interns so that we can do the things that I mentioned in terms of being intentional and, and things like that. I think if it starts to get too big, I think it, we potentially could lose some of that. John, I have a quick question about the flooding. Um, how did you manage that after the flood came through? I saw you, you talked about with the bunkers, but did you have any fairways that flooded out or any greens that flooded out? No fairways, no greens, uh, just debris and things like that. Um, but you know, you think about there's, there's kind of two components to it, right, in terms of managing it. There's what we had to do on the golf course to take care of it. And then there's the whole piece. I mentioned it was Labor Day weekend. Uh, what's our communication like with the golf shop and the general manager and things like that? And so the flood, the rain happened Thursday morning. We sent everyone home. We came back at 2 o'clock in the afternoon. Uh, we started the process. And by about 6 o'clock, it became very apparent to me 
not only were we not going to get through bunkers on Thursday, we weren't going to get through them on Friday, Saturday, Sunday, or Monday. We were not going to be able to get back to bunkers on Tuesday. And so we had to communicate that to uh, the head professional to make sure that they were aware of it so that they can then disseminate that information to the members uh, and things like that. So as people came in, you know, for Labor Day weekend and say, my gosh, what happened to the bunkers? Well, they're armed with that information. Uh, so, so there's kind of two, two pieces to, to doing that. I'm big on the communication. I send, I send an email just about every morning to the golf shop staff, the general manager, food and beverage, and sometimes it's only two or three sentences, but I want them to know what we're doing on the property. Uh, they are our front line. So when a member comes in and says, these greens are so slow, well, I want them to know why they're slow, right? We did X, Y, and Z to that. So uh, don't, don't get yourself in a position to where you guys, it's the ground staff versus the golf shop. Find ways to collaborate and get that relationship strong because once you do that, I'm telling you, your whole world will be changed for the better. Uh, but once you, once you start butting heads, it's, it's difficult. Thank you. John, with uh, one of your culture practices with Berta cutting, I'm just kind of wondering, are you on like a, you know, regular basis with that or do you kind of do that a few times a year? So I'd like to be on a regular basis. We weren't this year and I think we saw some negative effects of that. That was a pretty aggressive one that we illustrated there in that, that one right, um, that, that picture. Uh, but I think light Berta cutting on fairways, greens, all that bent grass will flat out grow. I mean, it just does. You almost have to slow it down. And so I think as we head into next year, that's gonna be a practice that we're gonna to try to, to get in a little bit more. And a lot of that's gonna come with staff. Hopefully we're gonna have our, our numbers where we want it to be. But yeah, we, we fully intend to do that a little bit more frequently next year. One other thing I, I kind of wanted to throw out there, I forgot to mention this too, but um, this has worked really well for us and we're even doing it uh, today. Uh, but uh, I, in my mind, my, my vision for this property uh, to, to maintain a golf course at a really high level is, is it's full, full day maintenance. It's, it's sun up to sun down, but how do you do that without taxing the same people over and over and over again? And so, so our philosophy is we're gonna have a morning shift and then we're gonna have an afternoon shift. And so that's really worked out well, not only from uh, how we're able to maintain the golf course, but it actually helps the personnel out a lot too. So we'll actually go in shifts uh, to a degree. Now it's super small right now and hopefully it can be a little bit bigger, but, but I envision where we have about uh, say 28 folks or so that come in in that morning shift. And then you've got another group that's coming in around noon and they're working noon to eight. And the things that you can get done on the golf course in the summertime, in the evenings, whether it's dry cuts, applications, uh, driving range detail work that you can't do in the morning has been super uh, uh, beneficial for us. And so that's really what we're trying to do moving forward. We believe that AITs and interns will play an integral role in that. And so they will sort of flop and, and go back and forth. So sometimes you've got the morning shift, sometimes you've got the evening shift and it, it gives you a chance to sleep in quite frankly, or you know, go get your oil changer or run some errands and do some stuff like that. But even on a smaller scale today, I think we've got, um, I think we have five in today. It's actually pretty big, but even with two or three running that afternoon and evening shift, it's been great. They're finishing up doing some fertility on the golf course uh, tonight that we couldn't finish up over the last couple of days. And uh, so that's, that's something too that we would, we would put in place for, for interns to come. Awesome. Uh, any other questions uh, while we have Mr. Ballard on the, on the call? Yeah, I have a quick question. So you have, I saw that you had like burned some stuff and I was just curious as to what you were burning and why you were burning it. Cause I thought that was interesting. I'd never seen that done before. Yeah, so good question. It was basically our native areas that we allow to grow up. So these are kind of waist high grasses. And so number one, it's a, it's a quick way to get them cleaned up uh, versus going in and trying to mow them down and collect them and things like that. So that, that's one of the first reasons that we did. And then secondly, trying to kind of sterilize that soil. I'm not sure how effective that is, uh, but, but certainly that was some of the thought process behind it. So some of that weed seed that's 
that's in that soil bank right there that if we get it hot enough, maybe we eliminate some of that. And so therefore kind of reduce our, our, uh, our weed pressure. And then once it was burned down, we were able to go through and, and get the sprayers out, spray our pre-emergence for the season where we've got good contact of the product to the soil, get uh, either irrigation or rainwater to rinse that in and, and, uh, and kind of help us out that way. Good question. Anybody else? Yeah, just kind of a follow up to that. So how did it work out for you? You put down your pre-emergent and then did you notice a significant difference this season? I thought it was pretty good through June and then it started to get kind of wild after that. And so we had to double back and do some post-emergent applications. I think I mentioned Johnson grass. We have a tremendous amount of Johnson grass, which is a real problem. Uh, so we actually went in this fall in some of our more high profile areas, uh, just went in and, and sprayed Roundup on top of that and trying to get that eliminated and get some, some, uh, some different grasses established. But, you know, it, it worked okay. Uh, but again, like anything, you, you just can't do something once and walk away from it and think it's going to be great. Golf management is ongoing, consistent maintenance all the time. Yeah, definitely. I just, yeah, I found that interesting too. I've never seen that before. And I was just curious, you know, how it worked out. Was a fire department uh, on hand when you were burning stuff? <laughs> they, uh, uh, they were, we had to get a permit to do it. And uh, they were like kids in a candy store. Like we couldn't get it going at first because it was too green. And they were like, well, light, light it up, light it up. I mean, and uh, we finally got it going pretty good and they, they were pretty excited about it. So but uh, yeah, we had, we had to obtain some permits and, and get them out there. Perfect. Thank you, John. You're welcome. Okay, I don't know if there's any more. I'll let people chime in. Um, but awesome, that was a really good presentation. And uh, I think my guess is with a few people in here that you, you might get some, uh, some internship applications coming your way this year. Um, which would be nice. I haven't been there since Roger was there. It's been a few years, but um, it, it would be fun to get back there and see the course now. Um, so if nobody else has any uh, questions, then uh, I'll end the recording. Um, but let's give John a round of applause through either uh, unmuting or through your reactions. You can do the clapping like I have there on my, on my screen. <laughs> I appreciate y'all's time and, uh, you know, hopefully maybe, uh, maybe next year I can come up and visit with you guys in person a little bit. We can get a chance to, to talk a little bit. Is, is there anything that, is there anything in additional, what are you guys looking for in your internships? I would say, uh, a lot of people, like at least with the interns I worked with, is just experience on everything. Um, it's experience on, you know, mowing, experience on spray rigs, experience knowing what's going into those sprays. Uh, but just overall experience is what people are looking for, I think. Yeah, along with what Ben said, just kind of diversifying, learning a little bit of everything. You mentioned that your first internship was just mowing greens every morning, kind of getting away from that, obviously getting that ground experience, but also learning some things up through the rankings. Yeah, I'd say for me, so last this past summer was, I wanted to learn everything I could about bent grass. Um, coming from a similar course, same as you, bent grass fairways, tees and greens, um, different varieties and stuff like that. But um, I really wanted to learn about bent grass and that was, you know, something I wanted to do. Also spraying and going from there. Gotcha. That's all good. I think uh, opportunities to, you know, volunteer at a tournament at another course is a great networking experience, meeting a bunch of people from across the country. That's something I looked for in my internship this year. Well, it's just definitely a different way of doing things, different perspectives, uh, management styles. And I know you had alluded to emailing your golf shop, um, Food and beverage, I think maybe getting on some of the mechanical aspects so you can establish a better relationship with your shop managers. Um, just getting through processes and stuff, you know, in the classroom, we're getting it from the book and it's 
great, but it's definitely a better way to learn going out and putting the applications to practice. Uh, as a junior going into senior year, like as a last internship, my past two, like you really get to like mow and spray and learn that stuff. But like almost coming into the real world, like I want to get like my professional skills really honed in, like being able to like run crews and um, be on top of stuff like that and be able to work with upper management is like a really big thing for I know some of the older guys, at least like going into AIT or assistant jobs, like so they're not hitting a wall when they get out in the real world. Sure. Do you guys, uh, <clears throat> this may be a Dr. Comiskey question, do you guys do any mock interviewing or anything like that? Um, we, this year, will have some superintendents come in and talk about interviewing. We're not going to do any actual mock interviews um, in class. I know Michigan State does it. I, I don't know if you uh, go back there at all. Um, I, I know you have some ties to Michigan State, but like uh, Dan Mearsman, I think, and a few others go back to Michigan State and they do some mock interviews. Um, we don't really do them as much. We offer a lot of networking opportunities. Normally, when it's not COVID, we have a job fair where everybody's in coat and tie and they're meeting people and, um, and asking questions. Um, in the two-year program, though, we will talk about interviewing and kind of discuss that aspect, but we don't do any mock interviews, um, so to speak. Okay. I, I was just, I was curious. I'm not sure. I, I think there could be some value in it. I think that's, you know, I've, I've been in interviews and certainly been very nervous and kind of overwhelmed and, and things like that, but uh, just I didn't know if there, there could be some value in that and, and doing that on a, a scale with interns and, and even AITs. Yeah, there's certainly value in it for sure. Um, I think the more you do it, the more comfortable you get, just like giving a speech or doing anything else. So value yeah. Yeah, for the interview process, do you mean like just sitting and taking an interview or actually interviewing other people to get that perspective since we'll have to hire our crews and stuff? Now, I was thinking more for your all's uh, benefit, you searching for the job. So once you graduate, you know, you're going to be in the job market and you're going to be applying and actually you being in the suit and tie, uh, sitting in front of a panel of two or three or four people, a board of directors or whoever it may be. Uh, assimilating a presentation that's maybe something PowerPoint related or, you know, kind of there's a booklet that goes through that talks about your work history, you know, why are you the best person for this job, that kind of thing. And just get comfortable being uncomfortable. And so when you go for the real time, it's like, well, at least I've done it once, you know, and, and then you could, you could get feedback during the interview, you know, so if I'm interviewing you along with my head professional and food and beverage and, you know, Heidi, uh, the marketing girl, um, you know, we could stop and talk about stuff like that uh, during the time. That was that was something I was thinking about maybe adding to kind of the internship program. That you, that we do one of those. Yeah, so we do that actually here as part of the um, program, just not as part of like I have an internship class. We don't do it there. The final project for the two-year students is basically a boardroom meeting where they're in there interviewing with a board. So we actually do it at a country club local to us. There's probably eight superintendents who are acting as board members and you're oh, in a nice. coat and tie, you know, basically negotiating for a job. And I think, um, Ben, maybe you could comment on it. I think Brad Jacobowski um, started doing that in one of his classes to the senior seminar. So I think they're starting to integrate it in the four-year program, but we do it as well. Um, it's a great experience. I mean, it's real world. You show up to the country club and you're there for an interview and, and uh, you kind of don't know what to expect. And you get up in front of that room and people start making phone calls and rattling the curtains behind you. It, it gets pretty nerve wracking for uh, the students. So it's a good experience. Yeah, I like it. I think there's good, because think about it. I mean, it's, a, it's an interesting profession where in a lot of situations you're being interviewed by people that know nothing about what it is that you're going to do. And I mean, you would never, you would never get an attorney position with that. You know, other attorneys would interview you for the job. No one else is going to be, the superintendent. So it's, so learning how to maybe, you know, communicate in, in their language or things that they can understand. We don't need to talk about a bunch of, you know, turf terminology, but they do understand ROIs, equipment, lease packages versus, you know, capital, different things like that. All right, well, I think that we're right at seven o'clock, so we should probably uh, end the recording. And uh, again, let's everybody thank uh, John for taking his time on a 
Tuesday night to speak to you. Hopefully, John will get you to um, come in person next year uh, and speak to the group uh, when, when everything's back to normal, whenever that is. Yeah, that'd be great. Thanks for having me again, guys. Again, if you, uh, if you have a, another question or anything at all, there's all my contact and uh, best of luck to, to each and every one of you. Thank you. Thanks, John. Thank you. And be well. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, John. Thanks, guys.